I'd invite you to turn in your Bibles this morning to the book of Revelation. We will continue our progress through this magnificent book. You might be wondering if our world is off the tracks. Train derailments are on our minds lately. Since 1990, there have been some 54,391 train derailments in the United States of America. That's 1,704 per year. That's a lot of train derailments. In fact, this month, the derailment of one particular train in Ohio spilling toxic chemicals has caught our attention. And you might wonder, has the world itself gone off the rails? Are are we on the brink of World War III or financial collapse? Can we trust our elected officials or those who are in charge of the world? Is there anybody out there telling the truth? Can you believe the news? Is our own culture pulling a Casey Jones and like a runaway freight train careening towards disaster, moral catastrophe? Well, you need to know this morning that history is on the track. The world is on God's track. It is going exactly where God has said it would go. It's going according to plan. And God has his plans, and sinful, rebellious humanity has its plans, and the God of this world, the one who blinds the minds of unbelievers so they don't believe the gospel, has his plans. The rebellion of mankind and the tyranny of Satan are both on a short leash. They are, in fact, implements in God's sovereign hand to orchestrate history as he has ordained. So Christian, take courage. When we open the book of Revelation, we are seeing the the end from the beginning. We are seeing that Jesus wins. This is good news. This grants courage. This grants courage to believers caught in the midst of a world running in all the wrong directions. And of course, humanity has gone off the rails ever since Genesis 3. But the world and its history is headed right where God said it would. God's promises have not been forgotten, His plans have not changed. His destiny for believers is not under threat. God wins. We need what we will discover this morning in the book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus the Christ. We're going to be looking at Revelation 1, 4 through 8. I'm going to back up and begin in verse 1, reading our text this morning. Follow along with me as I read God's word. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show to his slaves the things which must soon take place. And he sent and communicated it by his angel to his slave John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. John To the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before the throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood, and he has made us to be a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. These opening lines of the book of the Revelation serve something as the address. It's like the envelope. From me to you. This letter, this pastoral letter of predictive prophecy is from John to seven churches. So we're seeing in these opening scenes the address of this letter. 
We're gonna look this morning at five features of John's introduction that prepare us to study the Revelation and more than that, more than just a preparation to study the book, a preparation to anticipate its fulfillment. This opening salvo is foundational for us to be prepared to understand what's in this book, but more importantly, to be prepared for life ahead as we await Jesus' return. The first feature of this opening is the Revelation's recipients. Verse four, John to the seven churches that are in Asia. This whole book, everything that follows, comes under the umbrella of this opening greeting, John, the apostle, and we'll find out more about him in the coming weeks, to seven churches, seven churches. And these particular churches are in Asia. And don't think about Asia, the massive continent on the other side of the world. Asia here in this text is the Roman province of Asia Minor in the first century. It equates basically to modern day Turkey. And The letter is addressed to seven churches in Asia at the time. Uh, There were more churches than these seven. For instance, the church at Colossae, uh, where we get the New Testament letter to the Colossians, uh, that church was in this same region. It's not one of the seven churches addressed. We might ask, why these seven? And, And we'll get to those in the seven letters that Jesus addresses to these seven churches. But it's perhaps that these seven particular churches exhibited something like typical or representative situations. You could look at these seven churches in Asia Minor and say, churches are kind of like this. There's a lukewarm church. There's a persecuted church. There's a church that got all its doctrine straight but left its first love. Uh, How do we think about these churches? And Jesus marked them out for specific encouragements and for some of them, confrontations. In fact, notice in Revelation 2, verse verse 7, at the end of the first letter, the letter to the church at Ephesus, we get this invitation. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That's gonna be a really helpful key for us as we go through those letters, but also as we look at the whole book of Revelation, even though John addressed it to those seven churches, real historical churches in a real geographical place at a certain period of time, the Holy Spirit appends each individual letter to the churches with this invitation. Whoever has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, plural. In other words, there is immediate application for all of us as we read not only chapters two and three in the letters to the seven churches, but the entirety of the book that is addressed to them. So our invitation this morning to one another, my invitation to you, the Holy Spirit's invitation to all of us is, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. This will have direct application for us. That same invitation shows up at the end of each one of those letters. That means successive generations of followers of Christ will be indicted, encouraged, confronted by this book. In the last 20 centuries, think about this, in the last 20 centuries, no reader of this book, this pastoral narrative uh, delineating future history, no one who's read the book of Revelation has actually experienced the events predicted by it. Those are still yet future. And yet, readers of this book for the last 20 centuries have been blessed by God in the reading and the hearing and the heeding of it. And if you've been reading this book leading up to this series, no doubt you have already been blessed in the reading, hearing, and heeding of this book. God intended to communicate future things to his church. God wanted seven churches in Asia Minor that don't exist anymore to know what would happen at the end of the age. That was God's intention. He knew that in the midst of persecution and difficulty, or maybe even more difficultly, in the strangling grip of comfort and ease, we who follow Christ need the assurances that this book provides. The assurance that God will tear down this world and judge it, and the assurance that he wins in the end. These are sanctifying truths. We need to know how it ends. We need to know that God will destroy the world. We need to know that Jesus will take his rightful throne on the earth. That leads to a second feature of this opening that we need. And it is God's blessings. Notice how this letter is addressed to the seven churches. Grace to you 
and peace. This is familiar language if you've read letters in the New Testament. Other New Testament books begin with this very kind of, very same kind of greeting. It's sort of a command, invoking the blessings of God upon the readers. Let God's grace be upon you. Let God's peace be upon you. Grace, very simply, is unmerited favor from God. It's getting what you don't deserve. In fact, grace has been summed up with a helpful acronym, G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. That's a helpful way to describe grace. It's free to us in the sense of it's acquired by simple faith, but it is not free to God. It was infinitely costly to his son for God to be kind to sinners. God's justice had to be fulfilled, and the only way us rebels... The only way we sinners get to be in good graces with God is if God pays the infinite price that is due for our crimes against him. Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. That's a good description. And then peace is a familiar word. It it comes from the Old Testament. The word there was shalom. You know this word. Both grace and peace were used as greeting words. The Greeks would say grace when they wanted to say, what's up? And the Hebrews would say shalom when they wanted to say, hey, how you doing? Uh, They they were the common greetings for for hello and goodbye, uh, an expression of well-being. But but obviously here in the Bible, they are much more rich than that. You see, peace, God's shalom, shalom only comes at the cessation of hostilities that God's justice brings about. In the Old Testament, when you read about God's shalom, it means the time period where God will secure peace through superior firepower. He will subdue his enemies and make his enemies yield in obedience to him so that the world can experience peace. To look forward to peace was to look forward to God getting what God desires on the earth, which is everybody yielded to his goodness and to his righteous reign and to his just ways. Therefore, to be at peace with God means to have your enmity with God removed, your throwing your fist in God's face in your human rebellion, and God's anger at your sin washed away somehow. How can filthy sinners make amends with God? Clean ourselves up with our filthy hands, perhaps? No. (laughs) Try to outdo our bad deeds with our good deeds? Not possible. (laughs) Uh, Such an attempt is itself a bad deed, by the way, that dishonors God. It only adds to the judgment you deserve. No, peace with God only comes by grace from God. So for John to say to the seven churches, grace and peace to you, it's kind of like what Paul says in Romans 5.1. Therefore, having been declared righteous on the basis of faith, we possess peace with God and an entrance into this grace in which we now stand. Grace and peace go together. You, You cannot have peace with God without God's grace in the gospel. And if you are a recipient of God's grace in the good news of Jesus' death in your place at the cross, you have peace with God. These things go together. John begins this letter with grace and peace to you. Far more than a hippie, libertine, howdy-doody greeting, this is gospel-rich beginnings. And this greeting, this grace and peace welcome comes from the triune God. Notice verse four, grace to you and peace. And then you get three froms, okay? From him who is and who was and who is to come, from the seven spirits before the throne, and from Jesus Christ. This is a Trinitarian formula, a Trinitarian statement. Notice the Father, the Spirit, and the Son are the origin of grace and gospel peace. By the way, that's not the usual order, right? We normally think of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We refer to the Son as the second person of the Trinity. Usually he's sort of in the middle of that formulaic chain. But here he's listed last. And the reason for that is 
John is going to draw significant attention to Jesus the Messiah and fill out a lot more information from him. That's why he's listed last here. So this greeting begins from the Father. Grace and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And it's startling language, startling grammar in the original. It sort of feels like saying from the ising one and the wasing one and the coming one. The one who is busy just being. And, and the one who always was. And the one who is arriving. Grace and peace from him. That is grace and peace from the self-existent, eternal, unique one. There is no one else like him. He is the uncreated one. He is the ultimate one. He is not derived. He didn't come from anyone else or anything else. And he is not dependent. This is the God who just is. And this formula, the one who is and who was and is to come, has its roots all the way back in Exodus 3.14 when God said to Moses, this is who I am. I am who I am. And tell them, I am sent you. And it's quite possible that even in that I am who I am, there is the anticipatory uh, feeling of this is one who is coming. Uh, there is an imperfect form of the verb there. You, it could be translated, I will be who I will be. Uh, God always is, but there is an anticipation of his coming, even in the way he delivered his name in that scene. Isaiah 43.10 says this, Understand that I am, and before me no God was formed, and there will be none after me. He is and he was and he will be. Isaiah 44, 6 says, Thus says Yahweh, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, Yahweh of armies, I am the first and the last, and there's no God beside me. From beginning to end, I'm the only one. Isaiah 48, 12 says, Listen to me, O Jacob, even Israel whom I have called, I am he. There's the one who is. I am the first and I am the last, the was and the one coming. Now, John could have said the one who is and the one who was and the one who will be. That would actually reflect some of those Isaiah passages more grammatically tightly. But instead of saying he will be, he says he is the one who is coming. This is significant. This focuses our attention on the actual arrival of God in person on the earth in the person of Christ. It's not enough to say that God will simply exist for all future periods. No, something much more terrifying than that is at stake. God will arrive here in person. Everyone will be held to account. This is significant. And notice the second part of this Trinitarian formula here. Grace to you and peace, not only from him who is and who was and who is coming, but also from the seven spirits before the throne. This is a reference to the Holy Spirit, not to seven angels or some other spirit hanging out around the throne. And we know that because of the Trinitarian placement. He is listed here between the Father and the Son in this scene. Um, we also see that this spirit is the source or the origin of the grace and peace that is dispensed to sinful humanity. No angel could be the source of such things. And he is located at the very throne of God. And we might ask, why are there seven? I thought there was only one Holy Spirit. Well, you would be right. There is only one Holy Spirit. Some have designated this terminology as the sevenfold spirit of God. And I might point to the reality that uh, God created in creation week a seven-day period. That, that's sort of the, the picture of completion or perfection. And perhaps sometimes the number seven carries that idea of perfection or completion. At the very least, we have the idea of a, a manifold or many-faceted work of the Holy Spirit a complete or variegated work of the Holy Spirit, where the Holy Spirit is at work in the world and in his people. This pictures the Holy Spirit's omniscience, that is, he knows everything, and his omnipresence, he is everywhere. And you see this about the Holy Spirit's activity throughout the Bible. He was present and active in creation. 
He was involved with God's people in the Old Testament. He is the agent by which people are regenerated. He's the agent which gifts individual believers and places them in the body of Christ. Uh, He has a personal interaction with every believer dwelling inside us. He is the one who mediates our prayers. And we might say, according to Romans 8, he fixes them on the way up because we don't know how to pray. But he dwells in us and he knows the will of the Father and he adjusts our prayers to meet the will of God. And he is the one that dwells in us and cries out with our spirits that we are children of God, causes us to cry out, Abba, Father. He's the one that produces the father-son feelings that a believer has in his relationship to God, even using that endearing term, Abba or Daddy. The Holy Spirit is active, and he is active everywhere in the world. He is also the one who is uh, bringing about conviction of sin worldwide. He is probably also the one referred to in, in, in the Thessalonian letters as restraining sin or keeping humanity back from its awful potential until he is removed and humanity gets as bad as it can be. I think we also know this is a reference to the Holy Spirit because of the language that's used in Zechariah 4. You can write down in your notes, Zechariah 4, 2 to 6. I'll read these verses to you out loud. You can look at them in more detail later. But listen to these words. Zechariah the prophet said, he said to me, what do you see? And I said, I see and behold a lampstand, all of gold with its bowl on the top of it and seven lamps on it with seven spouts belonging to each of the lamps which are on the top of it. Also two olive trees by it, one on the right side of the bowl, one on the left side. And then I said to the angel who was speaking with me saying, what are these my Lord? So the angel was speaking with me, answered and said, do you not know what these are? And I said, no, my Lord. Then he said, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel saying, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says Yahweh of hosts. And it's interesting that not only in Revelation 1, you have a reference to the the seven spirits of God before the throne, but if you turn over to Revelation 4 and verse 5, You have this statement, out of the throne came flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Well, Zechariah 4 identified this activity as the Holy Spirit of God and used the same imagery of a sevenfold lampstand to depict the Spirit's work. Similarly, in Revelation 5, 6, I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. So the same language that the Revelation uses to describe the Holy Spirit matches what we got from Zechariah 4. This greeting comes not only from the Father and from the Holy Spirit, but grace and peace from the Son, From the Son. Notice verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. We get a, a threefold depiction of Jesus Christ. And this description gives a little more time to the second person of the Trinity. First of all, Jesus Christ. You you remember that Christ is not Jesus' last name. It is his title. It is the Greek word for Messiah. That is the expected one or the anointed one. And he is called the faithful witness. A faithful witness. That that, that means he gives testimony that is true. He, He lived a faithful life. He was a witness to the truth. He himself was the truth embodied. He is the image of the invisible God and so gives accurate testimony to the very character and nature and message of the one true God. In fact, in John 14, 9, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He is a faithful witness. He is also called here the firstborn of the dead. Now, that doesn't mean that Jesus was ever born into existence as if he didn't exist from all eternity past. The second person of the Trinity has always existed, but he has existed as son in relationship to the Father in the Trinity. And so to be firstborn in a household, in his case, does not mean he came into existence after not existing. It just means he's the preeminent one in the household. He is the beloved son. Not created, 
just important. This is a statement of his position, not of his origin. In fact, Colossians 1.15 says the same language. He is called there the firstborn over all creation. And then he goes on to say that everything was created by him. So he himself is uncreated, but he is the preeminent one in the household over all of the created universe. And Colossians 1.18, using the same word, calls him the firstborn from the dead. That is, he is also the preeminent one in resurrection. That is, he is chief. He has first place in everything, over the created order, over resurrection from the dead. And if you think about Jesus being firstborn from the dead, he wasn't the first ever to experience a resurrection. There were Old Testament resurrections. Jesus himself raised people from the dead during his earthly ministry. But Jesus is the only one who walked out of his own grave and he was the first fruits of a new kind of resurrection, a resurrection unto glorified physicality that no one else has yet experienced. Jesus has his glorified resurrected body. No one else does. Not Old Testament saints, not the Apostle Paul, not anybody that has gone before us home. They are absent from the body while present with the Lord. They will not get glorified bodies like Jesus' glorified resurrection body until the resurrection event described in 1 Corinthians 15. And that will include several iterations of what is called the first resurrection. Jesus is the only one uh, with that glorified physicality. And so he is chief, first place, preeminent one over resurrection. He is also called here the ruler of the kings of the earth. That's comforting. When I look at the kings of the earth and the king makers and the secret people behind the scenes and all the industrial cabals, I think, man, who's running this show? <laughs> Jesus. Unacknowledged. Not physically manifest, not seen. But we always know the kings on the earth are, are like water in the channels of the Lord's hand. They're all on a short leash. They're never able to manifest their petty, petty little dominions outside of the control of our sovereign God. And so present tense for Jesus to be called, he is the ruler of the kings of the earth. He's always the ruler. He, he's always king of kings. It will be manifest. This is a shot over the bow at the mighty Roman Empire in John's day. The first century, uh, first readers of this book uh, would remember the emperors who styled themselves as owners of the world, saviors and gods. And these petty little emperors are truly on God's short leash. They are also liable, accountable to God's assessment and every single one of them will be replaced. Those who think they rule the world now will be set aside and judged. Jesus is king. These three phrases that show up here in verse five, faithful witness, firstborn of the dead, ruler of the kings of the earth, all of these show up interestingly in Psalm 89. And you can turn there or you can write it down in the margin here. I'll refer to you Psalm 89 verse 27 and 28 and then verses 35 and 37. Here's what the psalmist writes. I also shall make him my firstborn or preeminent one, the highest of the kings of the earth. My loving kindness I will keep for him forever. My covenant will be confirmed to him. Once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His seed shall endure forever and his throne will endure as the sun before me. It will be established forever like the moon and the witness in the... Uh, sorry, I said that. I emphasized the wrong way. Say it again. It shall be established forever like the moon and the witness in the sky is faithful. So there you have faithful witness, ruler of the kings of the earth, and the firstborn, all locked up here in Psalm 89. And Psalm 89 is God's songbook commentary on 2 Samuel 7, the Davidic covenant, where God promised to David a seed that would come from him that would sit on his throne forever and rule the nations on the earth. 
course, that seed is Jesus the Messiah. But Israel was to sing this song, song, Psalm 89, reflecting back on the Davidic covenant throughout its history. They would be compelled in their songbooks to anticipate a Davidic son who would come to reign on the earth. In Revelation 1, John calls Jesus the faithful witness. Psalm 89 said, hey, the moon and the sun, they're in the sky. They are witnesses. They're faithful witnesses. And and that's true enough, right? The the sun has come up every day you've been here. Uh, The moon's been circling the earth every day you've been around. Are they faithful? Yep. As sure as the sun comes up every day and the moon spins around the earth, God's going to keep his promise of the Davidic covenant. That's the point of Psalm 89. Notice what John does with this in Revelation. What does he see? Jesus the Christ is the faithful witness. Well, that's interesting. Do you know at some point the sun's gonna go out? The moon's going away? It'll be turned to blood and then darkness. The whole universe will be rolled up like a scroll. In fact, in Revelation 20, the universe is said to flee away like a fugitive from the presence of Jesus the Christ in his blazing glory. Jesus outlives the sun. Jesus outlives the moon. He is the faithful witness. There's a third element here, and it is an outburst of praise. This is the believer's worship in verses 5 and 6. To him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood, and he has made us to be a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. I love these interruptions. Uh, they're called doxologies, comes from the Greek word for glory. Sometimes we, we sing the doxology. It's just an outburst of praise to God, and the book of Revelation is full of them. Here's the first one. You just sort of get an interruption of the flow, the start of the letter, and already we're singing. Already we're, we're bursting out in praise. To him who loves us. Stop right there. We get the love of God in Christ for believers all over the Bible. This is the only place it is depicted as present tense and ongoing, right? We all know God loved us and he sent his son at the cross to die for our sins. And we refer to that in the past tense. Of course God loved me. Here, strikingly, Jesus is said to love us, present tense, in an enduring, ongoing way. Believer, take comfort. What are you facing right now? Maybe you're beleaguered by your own fight with sin. (laughs) Jesus loves you. Look, we don't don't use that phrase casually to the world and just say, hey, everybody, Jesus loves you. In a general sense, God loves his image bearers on the earth, but in the special saving sense that is described here, this is for believers, And believer, take comfort. Jesus' love for you is enduring and ongoing and unbreakable. What do we learn in Romans 8? Nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. This is good news. And not only does he love us in this ongoing way, but he also released us from our sins by his blood. Think about that. Jesus, by his death on the cross, releases us from our sins, sets us free from captivity. And that's true in the sense of sin's penalty, which has been completely and totally removed for all those who are in Christ Jesus. It's as though God has removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. Go east as far as you want. Go west as far as you want. They're going the opposite directions. God has removed our sins. God has not only removed the penalty of sin from believers, but also its enslaving power. If you are under the dominion of grace, Romans 5.21, you are no longer under the dominion or the kingly reign of sin. You're no longer a slave of sin, Christian. And then there's a third part of being released from sin. That is the presence of sin. And, And we're not released from that yet. That awaits our absence from the body and presence with the Lord. That awaits our earthly tent being torn down. I I hope you look forward to that, maybe not the process of your tent being torn down, but the result of it, the transition to being in God's presence and never being able to sin again. Not even being, having the ability to have a stray thought. 
That'll be a glorious day. And so to him who releases us from our sins, to, to him be the glory and the dominion. And then it also says, he made us to be a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. Sort of a, a, a royal priestly class. These ideas are combined here. It, it means we are royalty and we have direct access to God. The, the, the collective is a royalty, a kingdom, and the individual, every individual believer, there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, and we go right to God through him. You don't have to go through other people to know God. But priests with direct access and, and lives of living sacrifices, we are priests to him. And this comes out of the language of Exodus 19. Exodus 19.5 says this, to Israel, if you will obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you shall speak to the sons of Israel. This was a gracious, conditional, and unconditional promise to Israel. Conditional in the sense that if any generation of Israel or any individual Israelite believed God on the basis of his promises, they had access to him by grace. Conditional in the sense that if they didn't obey, they were gonna receive cursings rather than blessings. They were gonna miss out on relational access to God. Unconditional in the sense that even though Israel would disobey, God will bring them back, give them new hearts, and make them his people. That's the issue going on there in Romans 11. And then think about this. Here, Gentiles are graciously incorporated into this promise. There's no distinction here of Jew and Gentile. This is just God has made us, all who believe in Jesus Christ, to be a kingdom and priest to his God and Father. What remarkable grace. So that any Jew who believed by supernatural power would say, oh, I don't belong here. God is so merciful to me. And any Gentile grafted in, undeserving, again, by supernatural power through the gospel, just says, what am I doing here? I don't deserve it. It's all of God's mercy. From him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. And a similar doxology here. Look what John says. <laughs> To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. That is, Jesus is worthy of all praise. This is a marked demonstration of the deity of Christ. He is fully God. Uh, no one else could be ascribed to these things. All the glory to someone who's not God? No. All the dominion to someone who's not the sovereign God of the Bible? No. Jesus is God. Uh, turn in your Bibles to Isaiah and I want you to see for just a few moments the, the jealousy of God over these very issues. He, he doesn't share these things with others. He is unique and he will defend his uniqueness. Isaiah 43.10, for instance. Halfway through the verse. Understand that I am, says Yahweh, before me there was no God formed, and there will be none after me. I, even I, am Yahweh, and there is no Savior besides me. Look down at verse 25. I, even I, am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. There's no one else who can forgive sins but God. Isaiah 44, verse 6. I am the first and the last, says Yahweh, the King of Israel, the Redeemer, Yahweh of armies, and there's no God besides me. Verse 24, I, Yahweh, am the maker of all things, stretching out the heavens by myself and spreading out the earth all alone. Isaiah 45, verse 5, I am Yahweh and there's no other. Besides me, there's no God. Verse 6, there is no one besides me. I am Yahweh and there is no other. Look at verse 12. It is I who made the earth and created man upon it. I stretched out the heavens with my hands. I ordained all their host. Verse 21. 
There is no God besides me, a righteous God and a savior. There's none except for me. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. I am God and there is no other. Look at verse 23. To me, every knee will bow, every tongue will swear allegiance. Do you recognize every verse I just read from Isaiah about the uniqueness of God, the only true God? They are all ascribed to Jesus in the New Testament. Jesus is unequivocally, unmistakably, fully God. This is the testimony of God's word. And then look at Isaiah 48, 11. My glory I will not give to another. And here, what does John say? All the glory to Jesus Christ. And then he adds, and the dominion, the rulership, the power. It all belongs to Christ. And he closes this outburst of praise with amen. A familiar word to us. It, it kind of sounds like what you do when you hang up the phone on a prayer. Do we still hang up a phone? I don't know. We push a button and the conversation stops. Amen is like the end. Okay, I'm done praying now. It, it literally means something like, so be it. Let it be or it is so. And John ends that here. Let, let it be so. Let all glory be to Christ. Christian, what is your message? What is your life's vision? If you were to get one tattoo on the top of a bald head, would, would it be this doxology? And better than a t-shirt or a tattoo, what, what do your actions say? What are you motivated by? What comes out of you when hard circumstances poke? Is this your life's song? To him who loves me, and released me from my sins by his blood. To him be all glory, all power. I think this is a great summary of a Christian's true identity. Jesus loves me. Jesus freed me from my sin, from its penalty and power, and one day even from its presence. He took a low-life rebel and made me royalty. He gave me privileged access to him. May he receive all praise. Let him reign forever. That's a, that's a good message for a Christian life. All right, number four this morning. A fourth feature of this opening to this letter is Messiah's return. Look at verse seven. Behold, check it out. He is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. This verse states the theme of the whole book He's coming. It looks forward to Revelation 19 and the glorious appearing of Jesus Christ to the earth. Now, if you're a, a novelist and a good storyteller, you, you sort of save the ending for the ending. You want to build up tension. I don't know where the story's going to go. I've gotten attached to these characters. I want to see how it's all going to work out. Oh, the ending's up in the air. Well, the ending here is up in the air, and it's coming down to the earth, and we know it from the beginning. We, we need not have this tension this isn't a, a good novel that's taking us down an unknown path. From the very beginning, this book tells us what it's all about. Check it out. Behold, he's coming. And notice how he's coming. He's coming on the clouds. He's coming on the clouds. You need to write down in the margin two verses. I, I told you uh, last week that the book of Revelation has more Old Testament allusions, or we might say Old Testament echoes, than it has verses, perhaps by twofold or more. So we got to know our whole Bibles. Uh, Revelation is going to point us back to a lot of Old Testament texts and some New Testament texts. That's okay. You can write in the margin Daniel 7.13 and Zechariah 12.10. I'll just tell you, Daniel 7, 13, we studied this on Sunday nights last year, refers to one like a son of man who is Messiah, who is deity, who comes to earth and establishes God's unending kingdom. And it uses this language. He is coming with the clouds. 
Zechariah 12.10 is a promise to Israel where God says, I will pour out on Israel, the house of Judah and the house of Israel, in other words, a united uh, kingdom, which hasn't happened yet, I will pour out on the house of Israel and the house of Judah the spirit of grace and supplication so that they will look on me whom they've pierced and mourn for him as for an only son. This is Yahweh speaking through the prophet Zechariah, and Yahweh says, Israel, all 12 tribes, will look on Yahweh whom they pierced and mourn for him as for an only son, out of the spirit of grace and supplication. That is, this is a mourning of repentance that God promised Israel in the future. Israel has never yet repented of this way. They have never yet looked at Jesus as the Messiah whom they killed, but one day they will. And they will do so in a period of time where God pours out on them a spirit of grace so that they ask for mercy and have their sins forgiven. That is the actual outworking of the fulfillment of the new covenant. In fact, Isaiah 53 is the song Israel will sing in her repentance. Go back and read Isaiah 53 and fill in all the pronouns. Who, who, who is the we that's being talked about there? I know we like to fill in the blanks there and we say that's me, the Christian. But set it in its context, it is we, Israel, will look on Christ. He suffered for us and we did not esteem him. We saw him as stricken by God, smitten and afflicted, cursed, but he was bearing our iniquities. By his stripes were healed. They'll look back and see that Jesus truly was Messiah. That day's coming. Zechariah 13 goes on to describe that two-thirds of Israel during the tribulation will actually die off in unrepentance and be judged, but the third that remains, a remnant, will in total, en masse, believe the gospel at the return of Christ. Their mourning will be a mourning of repentance. But, but notice this, look, look down at Revelation 1.7. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and notice this, all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. What? John is expanding something here. And, and it's an expansion we, we might expect if we've walked from our Old Testament to our New Testament in the progress of Revelation. John has not changed Zechariah's meaning. Israel will see Messiah and mourn. But now all the tribes of the earth are added and they will mourn as well. And not all mourning is the same. Not all grief is the same. As we walk through the book of Revelation, we'll see there are Gentiles who get saved during the tribulation. But there are a lot of people in the book of Revelation who never repent. Look over at Revelation 6. Verse 15. The kings of the earth, the great men, commanders, rich, strong, every slave and free, they hid themselves in the caves among the rocks and they said, fall on us rocks from the presence of Jesus. Why? They would rather die than repent. Look at chapter nine, verse six. In those days men will seek death and they will not find it. They will long to die and death will flee from them. They'd rather die than repent. Look at chapter 16, verse nine. They blasphemed the name of God, who's the one who has power over the plagues, and they did not repent so as to give him glory. Verse 11, they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. They know where the wrath is coming from. They know where the plagues are coming from, and they will not turn from their idolatries, their immoralities, their murders, and their thefts. How tragically sick is the human heart? Don't resist God. Again, you can write another passage in the margin. Matthew 24, verses 27 to 30. And Jesus there in Matthew 24, in his depiction of the same time period that the book of Revelation is going to describe, combines Daniel 7.13 and Zechariah 12.10. It combines the same language John combines here. 
Listen to what Jesus does with this. Verse 27 of Matthew 24. Just as the lightning comes from east to west and flashes, so the coming of the Son of Man will be. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, the powers of the heavens will be shaken, and then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of glory with power and great glory. What are the unrepentant grieving at the return of Christ? I still want to rebel, but I don't get to keep living my life. Everything humanity has built, the the new towers of Babel trying to reach heaven on their own, self-aggrandizement and and pride and, and human achievement, all of it just squashed. And what should man do in those moments? Yield in humility, repent. God, you win, you are king. I want my sins forgiven. And they won't. And so they will mourn and they will grieve because they are committed to their own rebellion. How how tragic is that? And think about the language here. Uh, They will look on him whom they've pierced. Uh, There were only a select group of people who were physically responsible for the crucifixion. You know, how many soldiers did it take to hammer the nails or thrust the spear or... Uh, how many Jewish mobs have there been in history who were actually there at the time and cried out, crucify him, crucify him? How many petty Roman rulers tried to wash their hands of the deal and, and have it done? Very few people in human history can be ascribed with a direct guilt in crucifying Christ. But what's in the human heart consistently, apart from God's grace? If God were here, I'd kill him too. They tried to try to throw Jesus off a cliff in his hometown. Listen, anytime God interferes and meddles in our rebellion, you can have one of two reactions. Oh, my rebellion's terrible. I need God. Or God's terrible. I want my rebellion. There's no real neutrality. And so everybody with the deicidal heart of man A willingness to murder God if he were here will be brought to an end at that moment. God will show up. Every eye will see Jesus the Messiah. The section ends with a a final foundation for us. It is the Father's pledge. The Father's pledge. This is verse 8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Some of these titles will be ascribed to Jesus later on in the book. Here, this is God the Father speaking. Here, God the Father seals the promise with his personal pledge. This is fascinating. He stakes his own identity on the promise of verse 7. Verse 7 says, Jesus is coming back. And the next verse, the Father says, this is based on my own identity, my own promises, my own integrity. Notice how he says it. The Lord, that is the master in charge of all things. God, the creator of everything, says. This God who made everything is a communicating God. He created language. He made creatures able to understand his communication. He holds them accountable for what he has communicated. His words carry the very weight of his character. Titus 3 says he cannot lie. Psalm 138, 2 says he has magnified his word according to all of his name. And the fact that the Lord God speaks to us ought to arrest us, humble us, and have our undivided attention so that we hang on his every word. And what does he speak? First words here, I am. Again, the the self-existing one. And he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Omega is the last letter of the Greek alphabet. That's the first and the last. He, He is the beginning and the end. This is what we call a merism. It means you say the first thing and the last thing, and you actually mean everything in between. This is like saying from him and through him and to him are all things. 
There was nothing before him. There will be nothing after him. He is all-encompassing. And then we get this refrain we already looked at, who is and who was and who is coming. The being one, the always was being one, and the coming one. And then he closes it out with the almighty. A familiar title in the Old Testament, the all-powerful one. That is, there is no power stronger, there is no will more determined. What the Son has promised, the Father ensures with His own integrity, His own namesake, His own identity, and His own omnipotent strength. This is the Father's signature on the Son's promise. Listen, there is no openness to the future. There there is no thought that there's some contingency, some decision that could be made, some slip that could mean, well, it's not going to turn out exactly like God said. No, it's all going right where God said. History is not off the tracks. Our sovereign God is taking us right where he planned. Friends, are you ready? Are you with him? Do you have your sins forgiven? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are king. You've always been king. You are ruler over the kings of the earth and one day your kingly rule will be manifest here. Your kingdom come. Oh Lord Jesus, we love you. We would like to love you better than we do. We pray that this week our thoughts would be riveted by this doxology, this introduction, this refrain We pray that these truths would be the ones that motivate us and shape us in all that we do and say, and all for your glory in your name. Amen.